Second part. Who hears the voices of the dead? Scream short of actual words, shoot from lungs choked with moldering earth, and the dead awaken from dreams of the great nebula. The hellish pain of being pierced by sword-like cosmic rays becomes their curse on the two who look down at their graves. Though to them it probably sounds like the most beautiful singing in the world. Where are we? Even to Dee, that must have seemed an odd question. What have I done here? Do you know? D. His memory seems confused. The horse voice said with great interest. Maybe it's because he slept for almost 5,000 years. Or else... He wanted to forget. That icy assertion silenced the horse voice for a moment. Its next words even sounded mournful. Could be. D's right hand went for the long sword on his back. Both the Grand Duke's hands sank beneath his cape. For these two was battle a dirge for the dead. Eyes on both sides held a crimson glow. D's eyes, the Grand Duke's eyes. The dead sang. The prelude to the final battle of Armageddon. Though they hardly seemed to be more than walking, the time it took the adversaries to meet spoke volumes about the unholy speed with which they'd closed. An endless-looking swipe of Dee's blade was stopped by the Grand Duke's left forearm. At that instant, Dee learned that the Grand Duke's arm was as hard as steel. Dee's eyes gave off a red glow. From that moment, his blade had a new edge to it. It took the Grand Duke's left arm off at the elbow and drew a geyser of fresh blood. The giant backed away, when churning in his wake, and after him dashed the figure in black, leaping. The hunter raised his sword high to strike, its blade giving off a bluish gleam that dropped straight down toward the top of the Grand Duke's head. A sound of unearthly beauty rang out. The blade in Dee's right hand had rebounded mightily, and the top half of it was now missing. A golden wind mowed through the hunter's chest. It was Dee that spared it bright blood. There was a gleam from the Grand Duke's right hand. In it he gripped a strange blade. Looking to be three times as wide as an ordinary sword, his blade had beads of blood from just slicing open Dee, while its grip was studded with jewels, as if in disregard for the comfort of holding it. D pressed down on his chest, yet he remained standing. Behold, the Grand Duke said to him, raising his blade before his face and turning the flat of it toward D. Its steely surface seemed to become a mirror, and something came into view in it. The faces of innumerable humans. There were men and women. There were the old, the hale, and the young. And each and every one of them had a chalk-white face etched with boundless hatred. As they stared at Dee. Just as I thought, the giant murmured, heedless of the blood dripping from his left elbow. When he bestowed it on me, I refused to accept it. I told him quite plainly I needed no thanks, yet he of all but forced it on me before taking his leave. He? Who is he? I no longer recall, nor do I remember what I did here. The cries of the stunned amnesiac harmonized with some strange voices, Voices of hate, voices choked from the faces that appeared on the blade. A most mournful expression skimmed across the Grand Duke's face. Do you understand, Dee? Do you see the faces on the sword? Hear the screams of those he sacrificed in his experiments? 
And they cursed their fed, and they cursed the Lord that granted it. And though they have died, they cannot pass into the land of the dead, because they were not given a peaceful death. But it is not the Lord who has taxed them so, not the fragile Lord in which the humans place their faith. He did it. Mm. And they should curse him for all eternity. I saw his experiments with my own eyes. The wind groaned. It became an attack by the enormous blade aimed straight at the base of Dee's neck. The blow was made with one hand. Dee braced his sword with both hands to parry it. Garnished with sparks, the hunter flew into the air. He'd been batted away. Mowing down gravestones, he barely managed to retain his composure. And right himself again. And look, wasn't that a different hue that stained him from head to toe now? From his face and chin, from his gloves and the black mouth of his sleeves, streams of vermilion dripped to the ground without a sound, dying it red. Blood. From every inch of D, every pore in his bloody, fresh blood seeped. This is a magic sword. He called it blue blood. That those who died with a decided hate for the nobility should focus that hatred to seek the blood of their opponent is nature's providence. Or perhaps it would be better to call it a deadly principle. The sword drank blood, and D was bleeding. While it was unclear just how much blood he'd suddenly lost, and the young man in black dropped to one knee right where he was. Fresh blood streamed down his face and hands, dripping from them. As the Grand Duke watched that impassively, a look flitted across his face, as if he'd suddenly remembered something. And a split second later, it became a startled expression. You said your name was D, did you not? He also had a... You. You couldn't be. The giant stepped forward, perhaps in the hope that D's death would crush the astonishment he felt. D barely made it to his feet. However... From the way he didn't even look at the Grand Duke, it was clear to see that he could neither parry nor dodge a second blow from the magic sword known as Blue Blood. The greater noble's blade was only six feet away, and the Grand Duke was winding up for a swing when he checked himself. A certain voice had reverberated against his eardrums, a woman singing. And that shouldn't have been enough to halt the giant's attack, just when he was focused for such a fateful moment. However, through his eardrums, the singing voice resounded, not in his brain, but somewhere else, in his soul. It was a song bemoaning death, a requiem for the dead. However, death was far from the singer, a song from the mouth of one who didn't know death, to let all know of the endless grief for the dead. Who would make such a song, and who would sing it? Genevieve, the Grand Duke murmured as if in fear. A woman in a black dress stood just a little behind where the Grand Duke had first appeared. A scarf the same hue as her dress hid the lower half of her face, which was set with eyes as blue as lapis lazuli and swimming in sadness. The white flowers she clutched to her chest were undoubtedly funerary offerings. And though the two of them were battling to the death right before her, the woman didn't seem to pay them any attention at all as she started forward. Was this really the interior of a train? In a vortex of egregious will to kill, the requiem flowed out plaintively, while the petals of the flower she carried trembled in an almost imperceptible breeze. 
Perhaps even the dead would lend an ear. The woman walked right past the Grand Duke and began leaving flowers at the nearest grave. Setting aside the old blooms, she placed several new ones there. No doubt she'd been doing this for a very long time. And the Grand Duke gazed at Blue Blood. The hateful visages were fading away. He returned it to the depths of his cave. I've lost the urge to fight. We shall settle this next time, D. And turning his gigantic back, he walked away, vanishing in no time. What keeps the dead from resting is bright red blood, and the woman murmured gloomily. But even her murmurs were like song. It would seem you, too, know nothing of the soul. Are you one of the Grand Duke Drago's retainers? D asked. The bleeding still hadn't stopped. His face was turned toward the ground. I'm Countess Genevieve. The Grand Duke and I are chess colleagues. The only reason I'm here is chess. Though it has become an extremely protracted game. The woman said her words like a song, but her hands never stopped moving, and she'd made no attempt to look in Dee's direction. I have a human girl in my charge. Never fear. She is safe for the time being. More to the point, you should flee this train immediately. Three former humans are looking for you. No doubt those were the three young noblemen who were after Annette. They are not as they once were. Now they are Grand Duke Drago's children, baptized in his own blood. By the look of you, you too are far from the norm. But I hardly think you were able to fend off their mass attack. Where are they? D inquired. Two hundred yards ahead. They're in the frozen blood locker. I imagine you know what it is they do there. Why not turn tail before they get here? The corners of the Countess's eyes rose with her sneer. From the look on her face, she'd already decided he would obviously do that very thing. Even when Dee got to his feet, her expression didn't change. On seeing the hunter walking away, the noblewoman threw her eyes wide with astonishment. The young man in black was heading in the same direction as the Grand Duke. That's the wrong way. It shall bring you straight to them. That's the job, Countess, baby. The Countess's mouth dropped open due to the unbelievably hoarse voice. What? Who are you? She asked in a dumbfounded tone, and as if drawing something from the blackest depths of her memory, she continued, No. It cannot be. Your name is D. The young man answering to that name was already headed toward where the Grand Duke had disappeared from view. Even after he disappeared without warning, the Countess could only stand there like a statue. Unable to follow after him, or to return to what she'd originally come to do. When words finally escaped her, they carried an emotion that her heart felt could not fully restrain, even after all these millennia. No, you cannot be. Your Highness. Second part, end.